chorus is by Andre Crouch. And um, how many of you know Andre Crouch, heard him perform? His background, I mean, his father was a preacher. And as a young boy, he would like to sing. And so he learned to play the piano just by ear. And he started helping his dad do these evangelistic services at a young age. And it has just, he had, he's praised the Lord his entire life. So, and this is one of his songs that's actually in our hymn book. So this is number 13 in the hymn book if you want to look it up and if you like that. So it's, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his home. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things, he has done great things. J. 
Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to Thy great salvation so rich and free. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free amen good singing y'all so as a reminder this Wednesday is the last Wednesday, um, or the second to last Wednesday of the month, and next Wednesday, we're going to be having a cookout and games instead of a movie. So if you are interested in coming to join us and playing uh, silly, games. silly games, we got uh, uh, badminton and... Uh, pickleball, I think we're working on getting a, a portable thing. Uh, what's the one with the boards and the whole cornhole? cornhole. Yep. Um, we can have some board games set up. Uh, Dawn's got like a dozen things of, uh, what's the word one where you put all the scrabble? Yeah, she's an English teacher, so she'll beat y'all. So um, she knows all those English words. So that's that's my reminder for that. Uh, if you did not get the church text or email, Blake's uh, calling to the church was unanimously approved. So he will be with us this weekend to worship, and we're uh, sorting out the details of his uh, you know, contract with us as far as pay and housing and all that's concerned. So we'll let you know uh, as soon as we do what his official start date is. Um, a reminder, Allegheny High School commencement. They call it their baccalaureate service, is Sunday, May 29th at 3 p.m. Hosting that is uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and the Students for Christ Club at uh, Allegheny High School. And so we have made a financial donation to help them with that, and they're also asking for um, individually wrapped um, snacks. They're writing to us to seek your help with refreshments at the baccalaureate. It's an opportunity for your church to give to the Lord in this joyful occasion. We know financial struggles have impacted us. Okay, so uh, seek for volunteers to bake a homemade treat to donate. Uh, please pre-cut large items and bring them to individually bagged or wrapped. Uh, so we have a, a couple here who are going to take anything that comes in Sunday, May 29th. Just bring it in with you when you come to church. We'll have a table set up. They'll get it over to the high school uh, so that they can um, have snacks if, if you want to help out with that baccalaureate service. So, um, yeah, it's high school students who are graduating. Um, I guess it's like prison. They don't want you putting crowbars and saw blades in there to help them get out. They're already free. So cut them up individually uh, and bring them in. 
Also, on the uh, note on the prayer and praise, um, this week's mission moment is all of the missionaries. Uh, but what I wanted to do is just go through all of the folks we have who are members here uh, who are in nursing home, rehab facilities, uh, or homebound, uh, and just remember them by name, and then you know, I'm just going to run through their names and where they're at, and then I'll go to the Lord in prayer uh, over them so that you can have them on your mind as well this week. We have over at the Bryan Center, uh, Marie Martin in room 109, sharing a room with Jeannie Elmore, uh, also room 109, and Carol Huggard in room 300. The Allegheny Health and Rehab, Iris Jones is in room A21. The Springs Nursing Center, Karen Austin, is in room 402. Uh, Maryfield Residence, Thomas Wade. Pruitt Health, Blythewood, uh, Virginia Wesson, that's Brother Billy's sister. That's down in Columbia, South Carolina, so uh, that would be a drive. Woodhaven Nursing and uh, Memory Care, of course, is, is Richard Hastings. Uh, Carrington Place, Kathy Hayden, that's down in Daleville. Over in Buena Vista, Betty Sue Pagan, that's uh, Brother Billy's sister also. Uh, the, the Woodlands, Larry Rubel in room 181. Let's see. Uh, uh, in his home, Derek Garrett there in Covington. Susan Kelly is at Elm Park, Assist, Elm Park Estates uh, down in Roanoke. At Nyack Hospital up in Nyack, New York is Cheryl Rubel. And homebound, Betty Reed. We do occasionally see uh, Grandma Betty show up. Uh, Jane Burnham is down in Georgia. Uh, Catherine Calvert, um, Teresa's mom, down in uh, Indiana, Brownsburg, Indiana. And Betty Wiseman here in Covington, Virginia. So now that we've you know heard their names and, and remembered, let's just pray. Go to the Lord in prayer. Father, there's so much life and joy and, and memories and uh, vigor and just so many experiences and stories that uh, we'd love to remember and share with these people while you've given us the opportunity for them to still be with us uh, here on earth. And Father, I ask that we wouldn't uh, forget them, that we would send them cards, that we would visit when we can, uh, make phone calls, um, just let them know that, that they are still precious to us and that, that we, we do still love them. And Father, that, that you would um, just reignite in us uh, the desire to, to be out uh, and visiting and engaging with them. As, um, they, there's such beautiful uh, stories and memories to be told and so much to be learned uh, from the wisdom of their ages and and Father, we just ask that this um, preciousness, this love for one another, uh, knowing that our own time is limited here on earth, uh, that, that you would move us to action. And I, and I ask that they would sense now that we are, we are praying for them and the love that we have for them uh, and that they're not forgotten where they are. And I ask this uh, through Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, I did speak with Brother um, Larry Woodward today. He is battling an infection from the procedure that he had. Um, he is still down in Roanoke Memorial. Uh, they were talking about doing a, a tube to help with an abscess. Uh, but he'll be there probably through Saturday, if not longer. Uh, the antibiotics don't seem to be helping out a whole lot. So uh, they, they're talking a little more aggressive uh, procedure possibly for him. Uh, so keep uh, Larry and Ann in, in prayer as well. It's oftentimes a challenging thing to have a, a loved one like that who's um, normally at the house and normally doing things and you know day after day they're not there and, and it changes your life. And so Ann is going through that. I spoke with her today too uh, and she's doing really well and they're you know prayerful for uh, that return. Um, yeah, we're going to be in uh, Jonah today. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. 
Uh, but that's sort of the nature of forgetting, right? You can't think of what it is that you're doing. So uh, did, did I forget something? All right. Senior trip tomorrow. They're leaving. At, well, Amy is going, so it'll probably be closer to 6.30. But um, 6 a.m. is the plan. The bus is ready to go. It's, it's cleaned up. And, uh, um, yeah, let's uh, be in prayer for safe travels and a good time for them. They're going to go see uh, David. Correct? All right. Um, yeah, David. All right. So uh, Jonah. Uh, we're last week we looked at Jonah's experience on the sea as he was trying to flee from God, and we saw that God compounded the difficulties uh, for Jonah going to try to flee from the presence of the Lord, uh, and and the impact that that had even on the traveling companions of Jonah, that it, it affected his witness, his testimony. He was no longer believable. Uh, and it affected his ability, you know, called to be a prophet, teaching people about the ways of God. Um, you know, the Lord took him out of that situation, uh, and, and they, they literally threw him into the sea, hurled him into the sea. And so now that he has gone, had his experience uh, trying to flee from the Lord on the sea, now we're going to see how the Lord deals with him in the sea. And we're, we're going to see um, Jonah... Um, come to, I mean, we have a saying, right? Coming to Jesus moment where it, the, um, it gets very real. They're, they say that there's no uh, atheists in foxholes is, is another expression that uh, often gets bantered around as far as, um, you know, the, these sort of manifestations where God brings that ultimate uh, decision into the, the immediate presence and the immediate um, experience of a person's life. And it's interesting that in chapter 2, we're going to go through verse 9, but we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 17, that, uh, and we're going to leave Jonah for two weeks in the belly of the great fish, um, even though it was only three days and three nights in reality. We're going to leave him there for two weeks. Um, this section right here is, is in, a, in a song that Jonah uh, sings. And it's, it's a song of uh, lament and um, thanksgiving. And, and it moves, interestingly, from uh, lament from, um, di through despair back to uh, Thanksgiving, and it's, it's, it's a section that is often attacked critically, um, even by some people who claim to be Christian, as this is just a tale of morality. Um, I don't take it that way, and I think you lose a lot if you uh, take the miraculous out of Scripture. We consider ourselves fundamental. That's one of the fundamentals, the five points of fundamentalism that uh, was so important in the early 19th, early 20th century, early 1900s. Um, and so we're going to look at this as though God really did this, as though Jonah really had this experience uh, of near drowning and being rescued um, by a, a, a great fish. And that's exactly what verse 17 uh, gives us, is the great fish. And then in side of the belly of this great fish, Jonah recounts what went through his mind as he was sinking down through the sea to the depths of the sea uh, to, to where he really thought his life was going to end. He had reached that point of, you know, you could just imagine the your mind's eye, the, the, the curtains being closed and, and you're about to die. Uh, and that's the depth that Jonah got to, figuratively and quite literally, when he remembered the Lord. So he experienced peril, despair, he remembered Yahweh, and then at the end he, he gives this confession of, of uh, belief in the Lord's salvation. So let's um, read the word. And the Lord, that would be Yahweh, appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, 
And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So um, God shook Jonah on the sea. And Jonah seemed unconcerned. It wasn't really until his traveling companions' lives were at stake um, that he said, well, maybe if I just get away from them and just put my life on the line, they'll survive, uh, and I still won't have to be obedient to God. And he has them thrown into the sea. But when he gets into the sea, God hasn't given up on him or on his life. But God, in his, in his providence, had prepared this great fish, had it in that part of the Mediterranean Sea at just the right time, uh, and evidently had that fish eaten near the surface of the ocean and swallowed a bunch of air for uh, Jonah to survive. And it, in our very limited understanding of how the world works, one thing we have absolute confidence in is that God is in direct control over every bit of it. God is uh, manifestly um, sovereign over all of the world. He is, um, that what is uh, R.C. Sproul says, that there's no rogue molecules in the universe, which I think is a, a great expression. And I wanted to look at Psalm 107 and just verses uh, 23 through 32 to hear uh, this psalmist uh, speak of the sovereignty of God that Jonah is just about to experience. And I'm pulling it up here, Psalm 107. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so is the title. And when you get down to verse 23, uh, the song goes this way. Some went down to the sea in ships. Doing business on the great waters, they saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his works, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So the, that section of the psalm begins with this tremendous storm where the people going into sea are seeing the wondrous works of the deep. They're, they're recognizing uh, the, the creation God had made, but that's not a big enough picture of who God is and how sovereign he is. So he, he brings them through this tremendous storm to where they think they're going to die. And then at his word, it all stops. You remember in the New Testament when they were crossing uh, the Sea of Galilee with the disciples and Jesus was asleep in the boat and he was tired and this great storm blew up and the disciples were afraid for their lives. And so they woke Jesus up and, and with a word he calmed the sea. And they were more terrified by that than they were by the, the like, who is this person who that even the wind and the waves obey? Now that power and that glory of God is what we're going to see um, on display to Jonah. And, and God is, is, is giving him this opportunity. And, and this experience that he has, he doesn't know it. But it's going to be a sign that Jesus points to uh, in Matthew chapter 12. And we, we kind of need to understand the setting of uh, where Matthew's at here in chapter 12, the point he's making is that Jesus is, is the Lord of all things, the master of all things, uh, that, that, that he even uh, commands what day is the day uh, of rest. And then in that lordship, he says, there are some people that I am the Lord of. They have placed me as the Lord of their life, 
Uh, and you're going to know that by the fruit, the works that they do are going to uh, give uh, evidence. Beginning in verse 33, uh, he says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Speaking to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure bring forth, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. So of all the, the miracles Jesus has worked up to this point, of all the wisdom Jesus has shared with them up to this point, they're still continuing on in their disbelief. It hasn't uh, touched home to them yet. Their heart has not been changed. And they think that if they see a miracle from God, that that would be sufficient. And Jesus' answer to them was, uh, but he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation, in, in this case, I, adultery would be idolatry as well, seeks for a sign, that's a miracle, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So here's how I... Here's how I understand what Jesus is speaking of. He's speaking of the difference between being saved and believing the person Jesus Christ is a miracle-working God or the person Jesus Christ is just another prophet like Jonah who's, who's you know, giving signs and wonders to demonstrate he's speaking the truth of God's word, uh, but those signs and wonders aren't sufficient. And Jesus stops them and says, you've seen plenty of signs to know who I am. You're asking for more signs because you're choosing not to believe. And here's the last sign you're going to give. This is the difference between having that saving faith and not having that saving faith, is the example of Jonah. So if Jonah was merely a story or a parable, and Jesus said that was the test, that was the example that's going to be sufficient for you to have saving faith, to overcome eternal uh, damnation and, and, and instead be in eternal unity with God. That's a pretty important thing. So let me, let me, let me put it in words that, that might... Imagine yourself on, a, on an airplane, 747 on the way from O'Hare to Honolulu, Hawaii. And you, you get almost all the way there, and, and just as you're coming in to, to land at Honolulu, a couple of uh, you know hotshot naval aviators uh, buzz by, and, and, and they you know turbulence causes the plane uh, to to roll, and, and one of the wings breaks off, and the the, the the cabin depressurizes, the things drop down, and you're supposed to breathe normally in this situation, right? Not like. <laughs> But normally, trust us, there's oxygen. And the person next to you says, hey, remember in that Superman movie when the plane was going down into the ballpark and he flew down and he, and he you know, grabbed the tip of the airplane and he stopped it before it crashed in? I'm going to do that. That's going to save the plane. Or the person next to you says, remember that movie about that airplane pilot in New York that landed his plane on the Hudson River? I'm that pilot. And I'm going to go up here and I'm going to land this plane just like I landed that plane. Whose story do you believe? Superman or Scully? 
God said Jonah was real, and that's the evidence and the difference between salvation and not having salvation. He wasn't pointing to a myth, hyperbole, or story, but something that really happened to this man. God grabbed him by the death strings and brought him to the very edge and gave him redemption at that point so he could do the work God had cut out for him. We continue. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, that is the, the, the uh, hell in the middle of earth, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. I want you to notice something. This is the first time that Jonah prays to the Lord. And notice how he starts his prayer out. He starts his prayer out referring to God in the third person. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he, God separate from him, answered me. And now listen to how he refers to God from that point on. He says, out of the belly of Sheol I called, I cried, and you answered me. You heard my cry. Instead of being God remote who exists and isn't involved, now it's God I'm speaking to you and you are speaking to me. For you, now he says, cast me into the sea, into the heart of the seas. And, and this peril that he's experiencing when he thought he was escaping from God, the minute he turned and prayed to the Lord, the Lord was right there. And he saw that the Lord was the one who had been there uh, causing all of this. And the second thing I want us to notice is that as Jonah's experiencing this peril, he isn't shy about sharing with God the peril that he's in. I think many times Christians, as they're going through uh, difficult trials, we, we won't confess to our brothers and sisters the emotional pain and fear that we experience because we think it shares somehow that we don't have enough faith in God, that, that you're afraid for loss of life or limb or finances or you know whatever the situation God is bringing you through. Jonah abandoned that just like the psalmist do, and he went directly uh, into the Lord. I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, you heard my voice. And he shared the things that were going on in his life that God was bringing to him, and that they caused him fear, that they, that they uh, affected him. And we need to be ready uh, and willing to share with one another and with the Lord that what we go through, we really experience as well. But we experience it not with a God who's distant, but with a God who's right there. He continues, driving down into despair now from the peril. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. Jonah literally has hit rock bottom, but you notice immediately when he's there saying, I've been driven away from your sight. He's not in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is disciplining him and not looking upon him. But even this far back, Jonah understood he was going to see God's holy temple. He wasn't thinking of the temple in Jerusalem at this point. He was thinking his life was over, and he was going to be standing in the presence of God in his holy temple. He was not shook to the core where he believed God had abandoned him. He, he, he really, truly believed his life was over. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Uh, the, the weeds, he said, wrapped around my head and the roots of the mountains. The, the Jewish understanding of the way the world was put together was that at the base of the mountains, they, 
you know, reach down like trees have roots into the earth. And so he's at the lowest possible point on earth you can get to before you cross into Sheol. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. This, this is all expressing the imminence of death uh, that he, but now he's in the belly of the whale, right? So he's recounting of where he was. And he says, uh, but you brought me up. And notice his language. He's, I went down. But you, God, brought me up. He recognizes it wasn't his work. It wasn't his effort. It wasn't his righteousness that caused him to be uh, brought up. You brought up my life from the pit. And then the confession of, O Lord, my God, Yahweh, my Elohim. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. When I was uh, first assigned to the Cheyenne, um, I was there for, I don't know, eight, nine months, and the ship was going out on deployment, and I had gotten assigned to... Uh, take this maintenance course. It's called Electronic Technician Maintenance School. Uh, and I was um, going to miss the ship being deployed by like two weeks. The last two weeks of the school overlapped with the first two weeks of the deployment. So they, they augmented me for the first uh, three months of the deployment. And then I flew out to the ship when they were in Bahrain. Uh, other folks flew back, and I stayed on the ship for the second half of deployment. Well, when I was finished with the school, I went over to the dive school uh, to, you know, see about getting into the submarine diver course. And the first thing you do on the first day is you have to be physically fit enough um, to actually even enter the school, and they make you do the Navy physical readiness test is um, sit-ups. Well, actually, it used to start with a stretch to be able to touch your toes, you know, while sitting down and your legs out. That was always the hardest part for me flexibility. But then you had to do like uh, sit-ups and then push-ups and then run a mile and a half in a certain time. And to get into the dive school, you didn't have to meet the minimum standards. You, you know, they had raised it up. So it was like you had to max out 100 sit-ups, max out 67 push-ups. And when you did the run, you didn't do it in tennis shoes and shorts and a t-shirt. You did it in your dungarees and your chukka boots. And you had to do the, the mile and a half in like nine minutes or less. Um, which all that was fine, you know, got through that just fine. And then they added one more requirement, and you had to tread water in their pool for an hour with your boots and pants and shirt and all that on. And the only way you're going to make that is if you hold your breath and you just relax and let yourself sink down into the water until you need breath again. And then you come back up, breathe out, breathe in, and get back, you know, floating. But with that minimum level of exertion, your core body temperature starts dropping pretty quickly. And the, the pool water is like 70 degrees, which is really cold in Pearl Harbor. It was a really deep pool, too, like 14 feet. And so after about 45 minutes or so, um, I, I, I just, it was so cold, lips were blue, and for whatever reason, my brain was like, you know, I think I can breathe this water stuff. And so I started to, and the, you know, the, I guess the, the diver instructors, they recognized the signs of hypothermia and stuff, so they, they jumped in and pulled me out and turned me over and squeezed you a bunch, you know, get you cough all the water out, warm you up. But I, I remember distinctly just being okay with breathing the water and letting it just kind of fade away. And, and, and it's like the... the Mind's eye, mental picture is closing in, and you know, then I feel somebody pulling me out of the water, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, like, it's fine, it's fine, you know, almost like fighting them back. This is the experience Jonah had when my life was fainting away. He says, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. The Old Testament talks about the incense at the altar being uh, the prayers of God's people. Uh, being a sweet smell to God. You, you know, the temple Moses, 
got the dimensions for were the copy of the temple that it's in heaven. And so the incense uh, that is there inside the temple is, is, a, is a reminder, a tangible reminder to the people. They can see the smoke, they can smell the smoke, and it's meant to be, God, when you pray, you hear my prayer, just like I see this smoke and I smell the incense. It's, it's that present to you, and, and that, that immediate to God. And Jonah's remembering that. And then he contrasted that with people who put all their faith in idols. And the biggest contrast that, that he came up with, uh, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. See, the, the idols don't love the people who worship it. Um, the people love the idol, and the idol in response may, may or may not be good to the people according to their understanding for rain or whatever. He said that is different than, than having a relationship with God. One, God will never abandon you, and two, God will never stop loving you. No matter what you're going through, in this case, this near death of Jonah, he still knew that he was in the presence of a loving God who heard his prayer in his temple uh, and, and and here's the really sad situation. He was called to go to Nineveh, who were worshiping idols, to get them to repent of that idolatry. And he didn't want to do it because he hated the Ninevites that much. And, and here God brought him to the, the point of near death to come to the realization that God is never going to stop loving him and these idols are completely empty. And so in that moment, in that experience, he continues, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah's heart attitude seems to have changed to repentance. First, thanksgiving to God for having saved him. Second, the sacrificing his own pride and his own time and his own hatred toward the Ninevites to be obedient to God's call. And the foundation of that is that the salvation of the Ninevites isn't dependent on Jonah's love for them, but rather God's love for them. So how can he stand in the place of that salvation uh, to the Ninevites. He confesses his faith, and he seems to indicate he's going to be obedient to the call in that moment of death, in that moment of despair. We're going to see whether Jonah lives up to his word or not here shortly. I'm sure you all know the end of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. But here's, here's a few things that came to my mind as I was preparing for this devotional that, that we can take out of this as application to us. No matter what we see in our life around us with our eyes, no matter what we think is going on in our situation, we can trust that God has not abandoned us. He has not stopped loving us. He's not stopping in, in his sovereignty over the situation. We also need to pause and reflect and say, am I being disobedient to the call God has in my life? And these are the things that are happening to remind me, to shake me out of my stupor, to be obedient to where God has called me. The New Testament speaks about when you experience these trials that are happening. Uh, James says, count it all joy. The author of Hebrews says, uh, the, the one that God loves is the one that he disciplines. So, so consider that uh, event something that may be uh, bringing you into uh, alignment with how God wants us to live our lives. Third, when we are despairing, we, we, we can offer that despair to God and we can praise God even during that time of despair because we know our hope is not in today. When we pray for healing of sickness, when we, our, our hope isn't that God will cure the cancer we have now, but that our resurrection body cannot get cancer. 
God may cure your cancer. He absolutely can. We saw it in Psalm 107. He can make waves that reach to the skies and, and get so large they, they scoop out the ocean and expose the base of the mountains. He can stop the wind and the waves with the storm. He can turn your health crisis, your financial crisis, your lonely heart, your emotional, whatever that is, in an instant. But right now is not where our hope is. Right now we walk and serve the Lord, and, and we need to have that eternal hope. James reminded us of that as we walk through his book. And finally, uh, also going back to, to James, we, he says, always be ready to give a reason for the joy that is in you. Every one of us have some moment or some experience where we were being disobedient to the Lord and he, he caused something in our life that turned us from that disobedience. It doesn't have to be a, a traumatic event like this. It could be a word from somebody that says, you know, what you're doing, you know that's not right. And, and you repent and you turn from that. And you, you need, like Jonah, to be ready to share that testimony with other unbelievers and with other believers and, and to continue to be obedient to the calling God has placed uh, on your life. That, that obedience is no guarantee that you won't have hardship. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Our reward is in eternity. So let's pray. We'll go off the live stream and we'll share some uh, prayer time together. Father, I ask for your healing hand uh, to be on, on Larry, uh, to, to comfort Ann. I ask for your, your hand of, of discipleship to be on each of us where we are failing to meet the calling in our life that you have placed on us, that we would serve you with all joy, uh, authentically, Father, that, that we would come to you with our fear and pain, our sadness. Lord, I ask that uh, we wouldn't just have shallow fellowship with one another, but that, uh, that you've given us this community to be your hands and your feet that we would reach out to those that can't gather with us, uh, reminding them of our love and your love for them. Father, I, I ask that our, our faith in your word um, would just be made stronger and stronger as we, as we see the heart of the saints that you afflicted and the saints that you uh, redeemed and, and gave just wonderful testimony to you. Father, un un unleash our, our mouths and our hearts into our community. I thank you so much, Father, for the many blessings you've given uh, to this community through, through our congregation, and just ask, Lord, that we would be joyous and faithful uh, to continue to share those. And I pray this because your son Jesus uh, was obedient even to the cross. And it's in that, uh, that testimony, that resurrected testimony in your throne room that we now come boldly before you in prayer. Amen. All right, thank you for those of you who joined us online. Reminder, food and games next week. Cookout, burgers, dogs, hot dogs, not puppy dogs. <laughs>